We're getting into the tail end of the day. We've got two sessions here. We've got Andy and then Angus. Andy's going to talk about e-commerce and, and, and cloud-based software. Uh, Angus is going to talk about innovating quickly in big business. Then next door, we've got Bob who's going to talk about education. And then we've got Douglas who's going to think about, sorry, talk about education as well. So if you're interested in education, especially in Africa, next door is the place to be. If you're interested in the crowd, uh, sorry, the cloud uh, or, or mobile or innovation, then this is where you need to be. All right, so that's that. Next thing is the party is on for this evening. It looks like there's a big thunderstorm coming in. So we're going to have it downstairs under cover. We've got quite a fair bit of money behind the bar. So afterwards, after the, uh, the last talk of the day, please go downstairs, have a few drinks with us, and enjoy the evening. All right. So without further ado, thanks very much for your time. Let's kick it off. Everyone today? So as Gus said, I'm Andy Higgins, probably best known for um, founding Bit or Buy, which we launched or about to launch in 12 countries around the world when the whole crash happened. Now we've kind of left. We sold our business in India to, to eBay. Um, most of the others closed down except South Africa, and we've since launched in Kenya as well. I've also been fortunate to be able to invest in a number of other internet businesses, mostly African businesses uh, in the e-commerce space, Michelle and Takealot.com, Payfast, um, also involved with uh, private property, Safari Now. And so for those, who, those of you who are from the rest of Africa, you'll probably know uh, it's actually now One Africa Media, so Jobberman falls under that, uh, Brighton Monday in Kenya falls under that, Cheki in Kenya, Nigeria, and so on. So I'm starting to get a bit of exposure to the rest of Africa, which I'm really enjoying. Um, but today what I'm here to speak to you about more is um, cloud-based, uh, the pros and cons of it. Um, I've split it into two aspects. The first part really is uh, more as, uh, from a consumer, as a, as a user of, of, of software as a service. And the second part is we've just started to dip our toes into building our own uh, software as a service solution. So I'm going to flip it around and just share with you some of our experiences so far um, at the very early stages of, of that process. Um, I also like to kite surf. So, um, Back when we started Bit or Buy, 1999, um, and for a number of years after that, one of the things we had to do, we were actually based in Australia, as we set our development team up in Sydney, uh, we had to build an engine to send emails out, right? Email marketing was an important part of our business. And we hired a fairly senior engineer to help us do this. It took us a number of years, uh, so, sorry, not a number of years, a number of months, to build, to build the system, and it was, it was okay, it worked, it was pretty buggy, but this guy was very, very technical. Um, I don't know if any of you are, are technical, you've come across the Send Mail O'Reilly book. It's quite a thick book, it's like this. It goes into things like, you've got to understand all these things, DKIM, SPF records, reverse pointer records, you've got to handle bounces, hard bounces, soft bounces, unsubscribes. It's quite a complex um, process, actually. And even the system we ended up with, we called it codenamed Paradrop. I mean, it was a major project for us. Um, it was fairly buggy and, you know, it didn't work so well. And then after, f after a few months, this guy actually left the company. He had built this cool thing on Pearl um, that kind of that did work. But, you know, then we were kind of stuck to make changes to it. Um, so now, today, um, you could choose any one of these. And there's many other ones as well. Uh, software as a service solutions. In fact, one that we use is one called SendGrid. There's a whole lot of other ones. And you can literally be up and running within a day and you can send out newsletters. Now for me, um, this is a big deal. Um, for most people maybe starting out, this has become the norm. But this is what really software as a service has, has uh, enabled us to do. Um, so I believe cloud is the biggest change ever for small business. And I have said small business there. I'm not saying, uh, you know, obviously enterprise or larger businesses can't use this, but I think specifically it is for small business where it's made the biggest change, um, where you wouldn't have been able to bef before go and build all, uh, a solution like that yourself. Um, now you can go and get it and pay uh, based on usage per month. Um, and it's uh, going to be a lot more cost effective for you and you can get up and running much quicker. Um, the other thing which it's done is it's... it's uh, it's made the barrier to entry and the cost for entrepreneurs to start up a new business. I mean, we, we raised $12 million in Bit or Buy within the first few months. Um, if we had to do it over again, thinking back, I mean, you could do it for a lot less nowadays than you could over a decade ago. Um, 
So what exactly is cloud? You know, this term gets thrown around quite loosely, have it in the cloud. Um, I, I think this explains it, uh, breaks it down and explains it uh, quite well. Sort of the bottom tier is um, infrastructure as a service. So that's more, uh, that would be your dimension data, as we heard earlier on, with their, their sort of infra providing infrastructure through the cloud. Uh, it would be your rack space solutions, your Amazon web services. That's all at the bottom layer, which is targeting uh, network architects, right? Um, then the layer above that, uh, platform as a service, that's more things like Google App Engine, um, Amazon Beanstalk, these sort of platforms that are, t are targeted more at the developers. And then sitting above that, we've got SaaS software as a service, right? This is targeted at the main end user. And, uh, and uh, I guess one way I like to think of it is it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a service that can be accessed through a, very a thin client like a browser, right? So everything is done through a browser. You've got access to the internet and a browser. You can make use of software as a service. And that's really what I'm talking about um, t today is, is, is that top tier software as a service. Um, so another sort of layer that you could maybe put on top of that that's sort of um, emerged is integration as a service. Now this is an example, this is actually just a snapshot company called Zapier, it's um, one of the Y Combinator companies. Uh, what they do is they st they, their business is to provide that interface to allow you to integrate b between different services. Um, so this is just a subset. There's, I think, now over 300 different services you can integrate with. So if you wanted to link your Shopify store to MailChimp to send mail, um, you can use their service to do that, and you don't need to be technical in order to do that. And for me, this is a big game changer as well, because in the past, we would have spent weeks, maybe even months, um, trying to and dedicated projects for people to integrate between different disparate systems. And for me, this is one of the big benefits of cloud, is that it allows you to now um, not be, you know, not have a whole team of engineers and you can get up and running really, really quickly with integrating with different systems. Um, some of my favorite um, cloud-based services that we're using, I've mentioned the email, we're using Zendesk, and there's great lots of other solutions for, um, for, for help desk management. Uh, we're using a accounting package called Xero, which is fantastic for certain types of businesses, especially or small businesses in particular. Uh, we're using um, sh uh, Shopify, of course, for e-commerce. Um, and so now, if you want to integrate between, say, your Shopify store and your accounting system, you don't now have to have a whole different, uh, have a whole project set up to now integrate your accounting with your e-commerce store. You can link the two. I hesitate to say seamlessly because it's never really exactly seamlessly, right? But it is a lot easier than it would be otherwise. So just to delve a bit deeper into the pros and cons, this is for software as a service. So you get cost savings. You can, you know, there's no upfront cost. You can, um, you can get going pretty much immediately uh, for normally, uh, normally for a relatively low monthly fee, and it's month to month. You can cancel at any, any time in general. So I'm talking more, I, I'm not really talking about enterprise level. I'm not, you know, there's, there's um, great businesses out there like HubSpot, which target more marketing. Uh, they still provide their service, uh, software as a service, but it is aimed at, at the high end. I'm specifically looking more on the small, medium-sized business, uh, sort of uh, cloud uh, software as a service applications you get. So scalability, you can, you can increase. Often you get charged based on usage. If you need to add more users or add um, more uh, units of, of, of whatever it is that the service offers, you can generally scale up and pay accordingly. Upgradability, generally you can wake up one morning and you've got more function, uh, one morning and uh, you've got more functionality that's just there the next day without you having to have had a team of developers developing that. Resilience, that's, you know, you don't have to worry about things like backup and, um, you know, uh, redundancy of, you know, RAID, hard, all that sort of stuff, although I suppose that's probably is moving further down the layer to more infrastructure as a service. Um, accessibility, you know, generally if you've got a browser and internet access, you can access it. Speed to market, you know, not this generally is relatively easy to, to, to get going. Okay, the downsides, less control. Um, so you don't have access to that source code. Generally, it's proprietary software. 
and you don't know what's sitting under there. So if you want to tweak something to work a very specific way, um, the chances are you're not going to be able to do that. Security can be an issue, especially for your data. You know, you're actually entrusting your data to a third party, uh, to someone else. Uh, compliance issues like you know, PCI compliance, things like that, potentially. Or, I mean, if you're looking at e-commerce, generally if someone's specializing in e-commerce, they're going to be pr providing you with a solution that covers that, but there may be other things uh, that you may not be able to comply with. Um, customization and data mo mo mobility, that's, you know, um, th the really good ones will provide open APIs, like for example, Shopify's got a very, very open API, and you can access that data. There's also other cloud services, for example, there's uh, something called cart to cart where you can, they've got all the major um, cloud-based solutions as well as non-cloud, and you can go in there and, and move your data uh, if you want to move from one platform to the other, you don't have to necessarily go and figure out, you know, at a table level what data needs to be moved across. So I guess that's something you could look at before. Um, many, I, I, I believe in um, it being open as far as possible and allowing you access through API. But so those are the things to consider. Um, I think for small business, the pros definitely outweigh the cons. Um, as the business gets larger, these, these things become more of a cons consideration. Um, okay, so that that's pretty much is the part about um, as a as a user. Um, I'm switching over now more t uh, to if you're in the business of thinking of or are providing software as a service as your business model. So I'm just going to share with you a bit of our experience so far. We are very very early on in our process at the moment. So probably if I had to speak again next year or the year after. Um, would have learned a, a lot more, but this is where we're at at the moment. So when we started out, this was just over a year ago now, um, we, we thought uh, what we wanted to do was provide storefront, uh, e-commerce storefront software. I felt that there was a, a bit of a gap there. Uh, we've got, you know, little bars and gum trees of the world. On the one end, we've got the big take and Kalahari's on the other end. And I felt there wasn't really a, a good solution locally for, um, for South Africans or Africans to, to, to use um, from an e-commerce perspective. So we actually started early stages of building our own solution. And the more research I did and looked around and looked at some of the international solutions that were available, like, for example, Shopify, um, I thought, sure, um, it's going to take us a long time to get something as good as this. Of course, the problem was you couldn't use a Shopify a year ago in South Africa because it didn't integrate with local payment. Um, so I went onto LinkedIn. I uh, found the relevant people at, uh, through LinkedIn uh, at Shopify and said, hey, I'm Andy. I found a bit of bar. Well, of course, they didn't, they didn't, didn't they never heard of it. Um, um, I'm interested in speaking to you. And the guy was like, well, sure, um, we, sure, we will speak. Um, so I, I got on a plane. I went over to Canada. And they're based in Ottawa in Canada. And I, had some, I nearly didn't have FaceTime with them because I arrived there and I was like, no, the CEO is busy and sorry. You know. um, but eventually they made some time, got my 15 minutes in front of the CEO, made my pitch, and they said, okay, um, that sounds good. For them, I think Africa was just a black hole. Uh, they never really thought of it as um, really much potential or, or, or maybe, not, maybe that's unfair. They just had, I guess, much higher priorities elsewhere. Um, and uh, then, so we agreed on a partnership, and um, now, uh, a, a year, less than a year later, that, that was in December last year, um, we have this over 500 Shopify stores now in South Africa. Um, rest of Africa, don't worry, we've got you on the roadmap. Um, we know there's a lot of issues there and challenges, um, but we hope to also that was part of the thing I said uh, with them was you know, we want to which is Af we have African African view on this. So f for me, um, looking back on that, the uh, decision you know this obviously comes with negatives now as well. We we don't control the software. We work very closely with Shopify on that. But um, f I think looking back, um, it was a, it was it was the right decision to go and rather partner with someone and to build our own solution. Th that's a really cool company, Shopify. You go there. It's like there's got like over 150 developers, in, and it's very, very cool sort of. And it's most even the like marketing guys, most of them are, are like tech guys, so it's a really cool environment. And for us to try and replicate that, 
um, would have taken us a long time, and I doubt, I don't know if we would have even, even, even got there. But what we've learned through this experience as well was that the storefronts is only one part of the e-commerce solution, right? There's a lot more to it. We need to, we, t we, 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 we there's, there's obviously the payment side, there's the logistics side, the marketing is really big. I mean, one of the challenges we found is a lot of people think they can launch a store, get up and get the stores up and running, everything's working, all those components are in place, but now, um, you know, build it and they'll come sort of mentality, but that, as we know, doesn't happen. So they also need help with marketing it. And I'm a firm believer of multi-channel, multi-platform commerce, multi-channel commerce, and so, sure, three minutes left. Is it, isn't this half an hour? Sorry, is this 20 minutes? Okay, three minutes. Okay, we'll move along quick. Um, uh, so let's let's move quickly. So what we're doing is um, we've we've identified the opportunity to build a localized order and inventory management system. So um, what that means is uh, one of the challenges I know from Bodobai as well is people sell on Bodobai. You sell something on there. You maybe have an online store as well now. To synchronize your inventory across becomes an issue. There's very successful companies internationally that do this. Um, Bright Pool in the UK, there's a few in the US. And so we've identified the opportunity to focus on that aspect of it, whereas the storefront is just one of many platforms. We can, of course, integrate with other platforms, not just Shopify, be it Magento, WooCommerce, or so on. Um, so I put Lean Startup up in here. I know everyone's probably got Lean Startup fatigue, but um, uh, I really do believe in it, and uh, for me, one of my favorite quotes is uh, from founder of LinkedIn, Reid Hoffman, where he said, you know, if, if the first product that you launch, if you're not embarrassed by it, then you've launched it too late. So I think that's, so I'm just saying that as well, if any of you use our products and you think we should be embarrassed, that's just my job. Um, so, extensive, so, so one of the big lessons we've learned, though, we did the e-commerce conference of a, a month ago, and it was really amazing, we got a really amazing response, and, and and no less than seven career companies asked, they said, no, we want to integrate with your cloud-based inventory management system. And we realized we were actually going about this the wrong way. So we turned the things, we turned it on its head, and what we've done now is we've built, built we, we're building it, we've got an integration with Shopify and with Bodobai so far, um, we're building it so that um, it's, we can throw the ball back in, in their court and say, yes, we'd love you to integrate with us, um, here's our API spec, um, away you go. Um, and that, we believe, is going to allow us to expand into the rest of Africa um, much quicker without us having that bottleneck of our tech development. So I think for those of you who are looking at building a, a, a SaaS solution, try and think about how you can open it up so that others can integrate with you. Okay, let's just move on. Um, three biggest costs on the financial side. I'm going to, I'm going to probably skip to this a little bit. Um, one thing I just did want to mention, though, is that... Um, I have this, and I just want to test it here because it's a, it's a fairly small audience, or fairly, um, what should I say, a non, like, hopefully non-critical audience. Um, and uh, I have this thing I've, 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 I've kind of come up, coined fi the, my 550 rule, rule. And that is, I believe, because support is one of the big issues, right, in providing a service, is I believe that um, it's, a, it's anecdotal, something like 5% of our audience 5% of our customers provide us with 50% of our work from a support point of view. Okay, so I would like to propose that, and, and uh, this is why I'm worried I'm going to get lambasted about this, is that I, we surely we should be uh, allowed to fire that 5% of our customers. They're taking up 50% of our support time, and I'd rather, I'd rather give the 95% to, I believe, more reasonable people. I'm talking the 5%, percent they just, uh, in my opinion, really unreasonable people. Um, and they, 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 they give you, like, they just, they just I don't know, they're, they're, they're ones who, who make, make your blood boil, you know, like they make you frustrated, and, and um, you just better feel like you're better off not having them as a customer. They're really not worth the money that they're paying you. Um, so do you guys think it's unreasonable to, do you think it's unreasonable? You think, as a service, it, the customer is king, you know, yes. does anyone disagree with that? Fire. So fire them. Fire. You would fire them? No. no. You make a big mistake because now if the word gets out there that you, you fired your customer, you don't care about customer service. Okay, what if I'm the other 95%? If, uh, you, you're probably the 95, or are you the 5, do you think? <laughs> 95. 95. Uh, um, so if I'm the 95, what if I most, of you, most of us here, let's say 95 or more percent of the people here, 
are the 95? What if I say I'm able to provide you with, with much better service? You're a reasonable person. I'm able to provide you with a much better service. Wouldn't you rather have me fire the 5% so that I can now provide you with a better service? Unreasonable. It's that 5% of people. I think it's probably even less. The one, the one who says to you um, is, is, is like, uh, Kirsty, help me out here. I think this is different from a product as opposed to a service that you're offering. Because this is very support. Yeah. Okay, I'm just testing this. I'm not saying it's the right way because I, I think that, that is a very valid concern. But, um, yeah. Communication, yes. Uh, yes. Um, so, <coughs> yes. I'm still saying that, that there's a small percentage of people that take up a large part of your support team's time. And surely, I, I, I don't want them as a customer. Why should I have to have them as a customer? Just because the general consensus is that customer is king and you always bend over backwards for your customer. I'd like to bend over backwards for the 95%, yes. But, but yeah? Yeah? Okay, yeah. so I think maybe it's a question of how you do it, right? So, so one way to do it is to increase your price for them, but in, in this sort of model, it's quite difficult to do. Right? Um, so, okay, I'm throwing out there. So it, it's as I expected, it's, it's divided. Yeah. Well, do you spend your, the majority of your time on the client generating the most money? No, that's the point. The exactly, so that's so my so point exactly. Strategically, you need to get rid of the ones that waste yeah. time. Yeah. Because electronic and personal. Yes, people exactly. Are that's my argument. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but there are going to be ninety-five percent of your complainers on Twitter and other Yes, that's the problem, isn't it? Okay. Anyway, I, I've just put it out there. I've, I've seeded that thought. Uh, I would appreciate everyone's opinion on that. If you want to chat about it, I'm just uh, toying with the idea because.